in preparing for my message this morning and what the Lord's placed on my heart, I really, I, I saw this video yesterday and I really want us to watch this if we could. I might, but some people see the effect right away. Oh, it's different. It's different. It's different. Yeah. Oh my God, it's different. Yeah. Okay. It's different. <laughs> Turn around and look at the lights. Oh my God. Oh my God. What colors do you see? Those. Those. You see colors now? Oh my god, is this the real world? <laughs> is this actually what it looks like? Savannah, what are we doing today? I get to see color for the first time today. And what's making that possible? I'm going to wear these chroma glasses and I'm really excited about it. I've been waiting for a long time. So. And what color are you most excited to see? <gasps> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! This is really cool! Oh my word! Let's go to our chair They just don't work. <laughs> Can you see colors now? Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my gosh! I guess it does work that well. Are you serious? I've been missing out on so much. Oh my gosh! <laughs> What? So what? What signatures? are the colors? What are the colors? Uh, we're not in. We're not organized. Can you see the uh, part of blue? Can you see them? I don't. I'm, oh my gosh. I guess they work. Orange, red, yellow, green, blue, purple. Oh my god! <laughs> can you see them? Can you see them? <laughs> We're going to begin in John, the third chapter this morning with verse one, and it said that there was a man of Pharisee whose name was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God be with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say Unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, circle that in your neighbor's Bible, Unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And don't marvel that I say this to you, that you must be born again. The wind blows, as Chip said earlier this morning, 
The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but can, you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly th- if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And Moses lifted up the ser- as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so the son of man must be lifted up and whoever believes upon him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Father, we just asked you this morning uh, that you would add your blessing to the reading of your word. And, and we, Lord, we pray for the pneuma of God. We pray for the breath of God to come into this place, into our life, in a new and a fresh way, Lord God. And we, ju- we just ask today, Lord God, that you would give us fresh sight, fresh insight, fresh intuition on what the Spirit is doing and saying to the church, even at this point. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I love the text. It begins to talk about that Nicodemus was a secret follower of Jesus who came to him at night. How many of you know, I don't want to be that guy, by the way. I don't don't want to be the secret follower of Jesus that's uh, coming by night. But Nicodemus comes because he realizes that Jesus is from God. And he begins to ask him certain things. And and Jesus is a a strong statement, which we would call uh, Christianity 101, which is, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus, now now realize this, he is speaking naturally something that basically any teacher of the law should already get. They were already baptizing. This was kind of part of their doctrine, but he was thinking so rationally, he said, what am I going to do? Crawl, Crawl back into my mother's womb to be born again? And he says, how is it that you can be a teacher of the law and not understand what I'm saying? He said, I'm telling you, Unless you be born again of the water and of the Spirit, you can't see the kingdom. And then he begins to break things down. He said, if I'm going to speak to you natural things and you don't get it, what happens if I actually begin to speak to you spiritual things? You're going to kick it off. And then he begins to say, don't try and figure out the Holy Ghost. How many know I have learned to do that? Don't try and limit or figure out the Holy Ghost because... The people of the Spirit are the same way. You don't know where they're coming from or where they're going, but the wind blows and you see the evidence of it. And then he gives us the great accolade that God so loved and that some people, can I just say this, that some people want to stay blind. Just like in this video here, how many of you know, some people would have just been happy to have 20-20 vision and not understand, can I say one thing out of the Spirit right now? There is more than what you've experienced yet. It, it, it is okay to be thankful for what you got. It is not okay to settle for what you got because God wants to move us from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Well, when I was talking about this earlier with Melanie, she said, can you imagine what we're going to see as far as colors when we get to heaven? I'm going to tell you what, I don't want to wait to get to heaven to see some things. But he goes on to say, he says, he says with this, He says, you can't see the kingdom if you're not born of the water and of the Spirit. And and this is specifically speaking about two baptisms. I mean, there's baptism in water. And there's baptism in the Holy Ghost. There's baptism in the Spirit. One is, is, is natural to the degree we're getting in literal water. The other one is spiritual to the degree that God, all of a sudden, God does something... uh, the evidence of tongues and, and all of those things. And in and, and thinking about this, some people would say, well, 
And then this is one of the hardest subjects, and it shouldn't be in a church. I mean, I've had a, I've had a hard time with this in, with believers um, because they want to argue with me on whether they're saved or not if they haven't been baptized. Now listen, listen, the Bible says this, Hebrews, the sixth chapter, the Apostle Paul says, not tearing down the elementary or the fundamental foundational things of Christ's law, His law of love. He said, we, we talk about the doctrine, which is the doctrine of laying on of hands, the doctrine of repentance from dead works, the, re, the doctrine of faith, the doctrine of resurrection from the dead, the doctrine of eternal judgment, and the doctrine of baptisms. So how I many know, we wouldn't take out any of the others, right? But then we come to the one of baptisms, and I, I find that some people really wrestle with baptism. Whether it's baptism in the Holy Ghost, or it's baptism in water. And then that, uh, many people want to say, well, I know I'm saved. Well, the fact of the matter is, is when, when I got married to my wife, the reality was, is... I didn't try and figure out what part of what Jesus said in this scripture could I get away with not doing and still be saved. Right? By the way, Jesus is a believer if you're going to believe in me. That means you're going to believe what he just said here. 100% promise you cannot see the kingdom clearly if you're not... Baptized in the water, and there's there's another there's 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 in the spirit. And it's like some people will say, well, well, you know, I don't have to go to church to be saved. I I I don't have to uh, be baptized in water to be saved. And there's a, there's a whole litany of other things that they don't have to do. And I'm like, you're right, you don't have to. The evidence of a good conscience towards God is that you don't have to. You get to because the evidence of a saved life means I've got a new want to inside of me. I don't want to. I mean, I mean, when I got born again, I was I was crazy before. I got I was crazy then. I'm like, if I read in John the third chapter that to be born again you had to buy a three piece polyester leisure suit and wing toed shoes, I would do it. It's like, what can I not obey about the Lord and still argue that I've got a relationship with Him? It's like I marry Melanie and I say, okay. What part of a relationship, what don't I have to listen to her about? Or what don't I have to be obedient? Men, the first commandment with promises, husbands, obey your wives. For this is pleasing. What, what, what part, oh, the guys are looking at me in that tone of voice, so it wasn't scripture. But it's like, it's, like it, it's, not about, it's not about what can I get away with and still keep a relationship with her. It's, it's about what can I do to cultivate that relationship, and it's like, it's like when you obey the Lord, how many of you know, it opens up a whole new world to you that you never even knew existed. When I was watching this video for the first time, all I could think about was my salvation experience. That's all I could think about, man. I, I, I put some, I thought I could see clearly, but I put something on one day, which was Christ, and the next thing you know, everything has changed. Could you imagine if, anybody like to go to 3D movies if it doesn't make you sick at your stomach? Uh, I, I love 3D movies because what if we were just basically two-dimensional? We could see height and we could see width, but we couldn't see depth, we couldn't see dimension, and we're walking around the whole time and we think that we're seeing stuff, and then all of a sudden we go to the IMAX theater and we put on the three the glasses is like, whoa! Never seen it like that before. Years ago, Melanie and I, we were, a, we were at a, a conference, and afterwards, a bunch of the ministers got together, and they went to, it was called a silent disco. And we thought, silent disco? What in the world is this? So, so we walk in this room, and there's two turntables and a microphone, and there's, there's laser lights, and people got glow sticks. This is this is inside of a church. I know that sounds sacrilegious, but they, they, they were having a good... There were no drink and no drugs, okay? But they were, uh, there was like disco balls and stuff, and all these people had these different colored uh, um, headsets on, and blue, green, and red. And you walk in, and you don't hear nothing. And there's all these people dancing and laughing and singing like they are in the shower. They can't hear each other. And you just look at them and say, man, y'all look dumb, you know? And then, they, and then they would push the button on the side and all of a sudden it would go from red to green and they'd be like, ah, and then they'd start singing real bad and dancing real crazy again. And, and the fact of the matter is, so are the things of the Spirit. 
Because the people that dance will always look stupid to the people that don't hear the music. So are the things of the Spirit. By adhering and listening to what God says to us, we are actually able to experience something in a different realm that we never even knew existed. Or we can just say, I'm okay the way that I am. I mean, I mean that, that's a heavy thing. Jesus said this. In fact, the first thing Jesus said is, repent and get baptized. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the baptism under repentance. And then the last thing he says in Matthew 28, it says, go unto all the world, preaching the gospel, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, making disciples of all men. So, so this is something that is important to Christ. It's heavy to Him. I love Romans 8, where, or Romans 6, where it says, Don't you know that as many of us that were baptized in water unto Christ were baptized into His death in the same manner when we were raised out of the water of baptism, we were also raised in the likeness of God. And this, the Bible says that this is the evidence of a clear conscience towards God that you got in the tub. There's always been baptisms. How many of you know that Noah had a... The Bible says that Noah's ark and the flood was a baptism. In fact, it says something strange about Noah. It says that Noah wasn't saved from the flood. If you read it, it says Noah was saved by the flood. How was Noah saved by the flood? Because the flood was washing away the filth of the land that was going to destroy his family and his lineage. And so the flood was not a curse for his family. The flood was a salvation not only to him, but for generations after that, the Lord looked at Abraham and he said, I'm going to call you a Hebrew. Hebrew does not mean you're Jewish. It means you're crossing over from one place in the Spirit to another place in the Spirit, from one paradigm of God to another paradigm of God, from a history to a brand new future. And it said when he crossed over the Jordan and left his family behind, he became a Hebrew, one who crosses over. And it says he was baptized in that decision when he crossed that water. Moses was the same way. The Bible says that the Red Sea for Moses was a baptism for the whole nation. And when they went through the water of the Red Sea, what ended up happening was that they entered into the promises of God. They became a, a, a fulfillment of the covenant of God's people. Joshua as well. Joshua had to cross over the Jordan into the promised land. He said, he said sanctify yourselves Gird up your loins. Tomorrow the Lord's going to do great works among us and we're going to cross over the baptism of the Jordan. In fact, what's strange is, is that river begins in a place called Adam, a city called Adam, and it runs all the way down to a sea called the Dead Sea. And so it's a perfect analogy of our lives that we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity, by nature the children of wrath, and because of the wages of sin is death, flowing into the Dead Sea, and God cuts it off through baptism, and we step into a new place. We step into a new day with Him. I found that we are, as a people, we are very independent. Right? We're, we're independent. We take the Declaration of Independence. And, and I'm thankful for all of those things in the context of what they are. But how many know we want to be in, interdependent on God? And it, it, it blows my mind that people want to redefine and negotiate what salvation means and how to do it. They say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to be saved, but I don't want to do none of the stuff He told me to do. I believe there's a blessing on the other side of it. That's why I'm passionate about this. I found this, that people who try and redefine what salvation is so that they can have salvation their way, like Burger King, have it your way, people who try and redefine that eventually usually end up leaving the church or, or leaving the Lord because they didn't get their way in something. And the reality is, is we didn't get saved so that we could get our way because our way was not His way. And our thoughts were not. So when all of a sudden I take up on this, I say, yeah, I want it. I want it his way. I just don't want it my way. And when I, I take it on that for myself, the reality is, is all of a sudden, 
There's, an obe- there, there's a grace that comes through obedience. I don't have it figured out, guys. Ladies, I, I just don't. But, but, but I believe this, that whenever we get baptized in water, first is by the water, second is by the Spirit. Whenever we get baptized, it is the funeral for the old man. It's the funeral. It's where you put him in the casket and you come out anew. And, and I always used to say this. I always used to say it is symbolic of your new life with Christ. The Bible never says it's symbolic. I'm going to say that. The Bible never says that water baptism is symbolic. It doesn't call it a symbolic act. It calls it a prophetic act. See, a prophetic act is when physically you do something in obedience and spiritually God releases something to you because you did it. And so it's not just like, well, we're just going to symbolically die, bury, bury. I, I believe in the spirit realm, it's a prophetic act in the same way that anybody, a guy by the name of Naaman, Naaman was, was not of the nation of Israel, and he got leprosy, and he was a major captain. And he ends up going to Elisha to be healed of leprosy because he hears that Elisha is doing healings and all these miracles, raising the dead. So, so he shows up to him and he says, I'm here to see Elisha because I need my leprosy healed. And Elisha's servant Gehazi comes out and says, Elisha is not going to see you, but he gave me a word to tell you to do something. And if you do it, you'll be cleansed. And it said that Naaman got mad because he wasn't getting healed the way that he wanted to be healed. And so in the text in 2 Kings, I believe the fifth chapter, it says he became furious because Elisha would not come out. And so Gehazi goes in and says, Elisha said, go back out and tell him to do exactly what I told you to do. So he goes out and says, Elisha's not coming out, man. Here's what you got to do. You got to go dip yourself in the river Jordan and you got to do it seven times. And if you do it seven times, you'll be healed. And here's what Naaman says. Why can't he just come out and lift his hands over me and declare it done so I don't have to get wet? That's what he said. He said, why does he have to do it that way? Why can't he just do it the way that I want it done? He says, it's not going to happen. This is, this is what the word of the Lord is. And so then he says, can I at least go and dip myself in Damascus near my hometown? Because my river in Damascus is a lot cleaner than the river Jordan. And he says, no, you got to do it the way that God said to do it. And then he says, uh, how about this river? Paran. Nope. And then he names another river, three rivers, as an option. And he's like, listen, just do what the Lord told you to do. And don't argue and don't think you've got to have it your way. And don't try and figure it out because if you do it, You'll get it. He goes and he dips himself seven times in the Jordan and immediately gets healed. The moral of the story is, do what he told you to do. Right? You know why baptism is so easy? I mean, I'm, th- I'm thankful I didn't have to build an ark for my baptism. Amen? I'm thankful I didn't have to leave my country with my wife and my kids, not knowing where I was going, with no two pennies to rub together, hoping God would meet me on the other side of the river. I'm, I'm thankful I didn't have Pharaoh chomping at my buttocks, trying to kill me in my baptism, right? I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful for all of those things. I just got to get in the baptism. Why is it so easy? Because Jesus did all the heavy lifting for you. He did it. He did all the heavy lifting. He, he made a way. It's a fundamental part of the doctrine of Christ. And it says when you do this natural act of obedience, it it guarantees you there wasn't anything spiritual about the Jordan with Naaman. But to obey is better than sacrifice. It's better than whole burnt offerings. And I always thought, why did baptism, like, 
It meant so much to Jesus. And it meant so much to the first church. And I repent, I barely ever talk about it. We'll see people saved and people say, did you tell them they need to be baptized? I'm like, I wasn't able to catch them at the door. It's, it's not a command. Only it's an opportunity. It's an invitation for new life to those of us who become baptized. I didn't want to get baptized, I'm going to tell you. I, I did not. I got baptized at age eight. I didn't continue to serve the Lord. It did not stick. Let's just say this. I didn't stick. It would have stuck. I get born again. I start teaching Sunday school class with five little kids. And, and let me tell you what. Can I just say this? I never felt called to children ministry. I never felt led to children ministry. And I've seen so many children get saved. And I think, just think if I was actually called or felt led to do this. So, Jesus says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. So they threw me in Sunday school, barely could read. I have like seven or eight kids from age five to age eight years old. And I'm their Sunday school teacher. Now, I'd been baptized when I was a kid, but I, had, I, I was a totally different person. I can honestly say I never really followed the Lord at all. And so I started getting this ache inside of me. You need to be baptized. You need to be baptized again. And listen, if you got baptized and you repented and you backslid, just slide back. You don't have to be rebaptized. But for me, I never had a sanctified life. I, I, I never served the Lord. And so there's this voice in, and I'm arguing with somebody about not getting back. I am I'm telling God that I already got baptized at AJ in my head, in my heart. And I'm like, hold it. This isn't Dan because if Dan wanted to be baptized, he would have done it a long time ago. I mean, be like Holiday World if, if Dan wanted to do it. Get on the Watubi or the Adorongo. Let's get baptized. If I knew it wasn't the devil telling me to get baptized again, I'm like, Durr, this could actually be God. So I go up to my pastor and I say, I need to be baptized. And we didn't even have a baptism in our church. So we had to borrow after service the first Christian church's baptism. And so we all went down there. And uh, when I decided to get baptized, wouldn't you know four or five of my little kids in class that accepted Christ wanted to get baptized too? And so I, I, I got a picture of me with, with the beard and the long hair getting in that uh, tub and going, and, 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 and I wish I'd have had a picture of all the little kids that were following me in that decision. Can I tell you what? If you haven't made that decision, there are a bunch of people waiting for you to make that decision because they're watching. They're watching. They're watching. God wants to show you things that you've never seen before, experience things that you've never had before. He wants to put a new set of, I brought these, these are some of Melanie's, I thought these were pretty good. He wants to put a, he wants to put a brand new set of lenses on you. He wants, he wants you to see things from a completely different light. My daughter, Nevaeh, I'm only mom just because I look kind of stupid, I'm sure. So. Don't, uh, yeah, that's good, yeah. So much for those glasses. So, my daughter, Nevaeh, uh, in the homeschool room this week, she, she said she wanted to be baptized. She had already accepted the Lord, but she felt a conviction that sh she wanted to experience that. And so Melanie's like, Dan, come in here. And so, so we sit down on the floor with her, and Amelia was there. And we just asked Amelia, did you experience any difference in your life or feel any difference? Now, Amelia was age eight. Oh, she was six, six years old. I said, did you experience any difference in your life when you got baptized? And she said, oh my gosh. We're like, really? And she said, oh, you don't even know the things I used to think. <laughs> you know, she's, she's living in such a, such a crazy house, you know, uh, she said, oh, you don't even know the things the devil used to put in my head. She said, she said I'm going to tell you what, and I just wouldn't think it. When you and dad weren't around, I'd say it out loud. And I'd get so mad, 
I'd say it and I'd cry. And I said, so what happened when you got baptized in water? She said, I felt like a snake coming out of my old skin. I don't necessarily want you to be a snake coming out of your own skin. But I do want you to become a new creature. Shedding an old life. That's good. Don't you know that as many of us were baptized in Christ, we were baptized in His death, and in the likeness of His death, we're buried with Him. And the old man, listen, listen, the old man is dead. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Jesus says, if you do this. Jesus said it. And in the likeness of the death, we're buried with Him in baptism. In the likeness of His resurrection, we'll be raised again. Not only spiritually right now, but eternally. Forever, forever and ever. I want, to, I want to read something just really quickly. I thought, I thought this was so good in Acts 22. If I can find it here. Acts, the 22nd chapter. The, of course, we know that the Apostle Paul has already been born again at this point. But he's about to be arrested, or has been arrested, by a bunch of radical Jews. He is in big trouble, and he's using that as a platform to tell of his, the experience that he had on the Damascus Road. Now, when you read what happened on the Damascus Road, uh, initially, it tells, you know, he sees a light from heaven, falls off of his horse. Jesus, why art thou per persecuting me? Who art thou, Lord? And he begins to talk, and he says, I'm going to send you to a man by the name of Ananias, whose name means grace. And he's going to show you what you need to do. And the scales fell off of his eyes and all that. We know that story. But in this story, it gives a little bit more insight of what the Apostle Paul experienced. And so the Apostle Paul, uh, Acts 22 and 12, giving the account to the people that are around him, says, Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwell there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour, I looked up at him. And then it goes on to say, Then he said, The God of your fathers has chosen you that you should know His will and see, and see the just one and hear the voice of His mouth. For you will witness, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and what you have heard. Now listen, I just love this. Verse 16 in the New King James it says, Ananias looks at Paul and says, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He says, Why are we still sitting here? You believe in the Lord, you've had an encounter with the Lord, he's opened your eyes to who he is. Now, why are we waiting? Get in the water. And it doesn't just say that. Symbolically, so that you can associate with the symbol of His suffering and resurrection. It says, get in the water so that your sins may be washed from you. I mean, that's a pretty strong statement. Get in the water so your sins can be washed from you. It is the evidence of a clean conscience towards God. Acts 2.38, they look at Peter and they say, what must we do to be saved? And he says, repent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the mission of sin and be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul and Silas, they're in jail, and all of a sudden, uh, they're free. They walk out, and immediately, the guy's about to fall on the sword, the, 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 the soldier, and they spare his life. They save him. They say, don't kill yourself. And it says immediately, he says, what do I got to do to be saved? And it says immediately, they took him and baptized him. Isn't that strange? I mean, right out of prison. It's Philip, Philip gets translated. This is so important to me. Philip gets translated from one place to another. I mean, like, like, beam me up, Scotty. Boom, disappears from a revival, shows up hundreds of miles away, and there's an Ethiopian there on a chariot, part of royalty. And he's reading Isaiah 53 and doesn't know what it means. And, and he jumps up in the chariot, explains it to him. And immediately the Ethiopian says, what's keeping me from being baptized since there's much water here? That's, it's like... This is what we do. This is what we do. Why do we do it? Because it means something to the Lord. Why do, why do we do it? Because it is an example to our kids. 
Why do we do it? Because it is evidence of a clean conscience towards God. It is our public confession. It is a great opportunity. And the Bible says if we'll do these things, that we will be able to see the kingdom like we've never been able to before. Amen. I'm going to pray for us real quick. Is that, if that's okay, pray with us. <laughs> we might talk about the other baptism coming up here next week or so. But I really wanted to hammer the baptism in water because my lands, God's looking for a response of faith to what He's already settled, He's already done. If you, if you look at it as just a religious act, I like what Bill Johnson says, do you know what religion is? Religion is what we do when the Holy Ghost leaves. Whenever the Holy Ghost leaves the building or the Holy Ghost doesn't bless what we do anymore, everything we do after that is just religious activity. It, it just really doesn't mean anything. But when the Spirit of God is in it, the first recollection of the Spirit of God coming upon anybody in the New Covenant was Jesus at the River Jordan. When He got baptized, there was something crazy that happened. He physically saw, John saw something he had never seen before. The Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and he heard a voice. He, heard, he saw something he had never seen before, and he heard something he had never heard before. And he said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. How many of you want to listen to Him? I'll, I'll tell you, it's not right. I'm, I'm so glad that I don't have to do a bunch of hyper-religious activity. 26 Hail Marys, 5 push-ups give a certain amount. But He did require a few things from us in faith to associate with what He's already done. And baptism was one of those. But I want to go back to the first part. It says, repent and be baptized. I just want to ask you this morning, man, God is so crazy about you. He so, so loves you. He has a brand new pair of glasses for you. He's got a brand new life for you. He's got an opportunity. Old things can pass and new things can come. And if you're in here this morning, and you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd like for you to slip up your hand, and I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. And if we're all born again, that's okay, but if you're arguing with something in your head, I promise you, it's, 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 it's probably God and the devil all at the same time, right? Because there's a battle of two worlds trying to keep us back. One more thing is, anybody wants to be uh, born again this morning, it's the free gift of God that leads to repentance.